Well, dear friends, as it continues, Merry Christmas to you all. As it is about to happen, Happy New Year to you all as well. This has been one of those weeks of, of haze of, of eating and festivity and being with people and running here and there. And one thing and another involving gifts, it seems. We've gotten them, we've given them, we've exchanged them, we've taken them back. Wrong size, wrong color, who knows what we may have done this week with the things we got. If we're honest, there are probably a few regifting piles already forming in some of our houses. Some of those gifts that we got that we don't quite know what we're going to do with. And there's some that we, we definitely know. There, there, there are the, the big ticket presents that we got that we're going to remember forever. They're the ones that are immediately useful. You get it, you unwrap it, and think, I can use this right now, and immediately it goes into use. There are the white elephants and the gag gifts that will hang around for longer than they probably should. In that category, I should tell you, it's a shame that it was only this week that I discovered the company called uh, the Meow Project. Do you know this group? Um, they have produced really realistic paperback books of classic literature translated for your cat. So, for instance, you can buy for like 25 bucks a copy of War and Peace translated for your cat which is the word meow printed 400,000 times over 750 pages. Had I known about this, my sister would have gotten one of these for Christmas. Just wait until next year. So there are all these categories of things that we, we've gotten, and, and sometimes we don't really know what to do with them right away. For me, I think some of the best gifts are the ones that I get and I put aside thinking, well, I'll figure out what this is for when I have time. And then six months later or eight months later, something comes up and I suddenly need something and I remember, there it is. I'm able to pick it up and begin to use it even though when I got it, I didn't know quite what it was for or probably didn't even realize the value of it fully. For me, that's kind of what happens at Christmas. Excuse me, at Christmas. So much happens in a short time, it's impossible to unpack it all. The best we can do probably is gather it up and hope that over time, over weeks and months and years that follow, we'll begin to see what it was all about. Certainly, we know that Christmas is about a gift we receive from God, the gift of Jesus, but, but that is only part of the picture, I think. I mean, that's the obvious one, but it so overshadows everything else that I think it's worth taking a minute to pick apart the other gifts we may have gotten. I want to suggest to you that although there are saints and major religious occasions that come all through the year and that we shouldn't ignore. There are things that happen right around Christmas that I think are really useful to us as ways of imagining what the gifts are that we get from God. There's a hint about this in the lesson from Isaiah this morning. It says, I have given you a new name. I think some of the examples we have of people in this period right around Christmas give us an idea of what it might mean to get a new name what new names we might be looking for in our own Christmas stockings and in the days that follow. So it, it's easy enough to go chronologically. We start actually before Christmas on December 21st with the Feast of St. Thomas, our patron saint, a good occasion for us. You may have noticed that we celebrated St. Thomas's Day here in a particular way this year with Indian food and music and dancing and guests who came from Indian churches and that's because by tradition, St. Thomas went to India. But he didn't just go there and, and evangelize. What we remember particularly about him is that when he went to one particular place, the ruler of that, of that area asked him to build a church. So if you look at the usual symbols for St. Thomas, one of them is a builder's square, which remembers this literal building of a church building, even as he was actually also building a church in the sense of a community how odd that must have seemed to him, this man who was a fisherman or a farmer or a small merchant, who knows what he did in his life before he met Jesus. But I'm guessing that, that architect was not among the things that he expected he would end up being. So all the more surprising to him probably that he ended up with the title of builder. In many traditions, that is how St. Thomas is remembered. Not as the doubter, not as the one who wouldn't believe until he saw for himself, as important as that is perhaps also as a reassurance in our faith, but as the builder. Then, we should think just for a moment a few 
kind thoughts for those whose saints days fall on the 23rd, 24th, or 25th of December. And there are saints for all of those days. But you can imagine they don't get a whole lot of attention. But as we're coming out of the fog and haze of Christmas Day, we land on December 26th, and there is St. Stephen the deacon. This man who was recruited among a group of other people to be a waiter. What we're told in Acts is that the apostles didn't have the time to do everything they were supposed to do and take care of the actual physical needs of those who were in their community. So they recruited pious people to come along and take care of some of those needs. Now, chances are St. Stephen wasn't just a waiter. Uh, what they were doing was much more than that. He was probably more like a social worker, getting involved in the lives of poor people, widows, orphans, those who couldn't take care of themselves. And if we believe what it says in Acts, he was doing more than just that. He was preaching and performing miracles. What I want to suggest to you is that if that's all he had done, taking care of people, he and his colleagues fed people, clothed people, found them housing, got them connected with services, as we would say today, and he kept quiet about why they were doing it, I don't think the world would have cared too much. I think the world is always happy to have problems taken off its hands. And so I think if Stephen had stuck with that, he would have been fine and we would never even have known of him. Where he got himself into trouble was when he began to remind the world of the why behind what he and others were doing. That somehow the full glory of God is to be found in those simple everyday actions and is to be found in the faces of those who are served in that way. And the minute he pointed out where God is in that picture, the world around him recognized how it was not seeing that, how it was not meeting those needs, how it was not honoring God in those people and those actions, and that's when they shut him up. So what we remember St. Stephen for is proclamation. That moment when he made that connection for himself in his mind. This is what I've been doing and this is what it's really for. And announced it to the world. He became a proclaimer of the faith. And that's when the world took notice of him. Then the next day, December 27th, St. John the Evangelist one of the, the close followers of Jesus, apparently very much beloved by Jesus. He and his brother were almost always present at everything, all the major scenes that happened in the ministry and life of Jesus. Uh, he and his brother were brave enough to go to Jesus and say, give us good places in heaven. Jesus responded by saying, well, you, know, it's a lot, you don't know what you're asking for. Can you handle it? And they said, yes, and apparently they did. James was martyred. And John, who was not martyred, is nonetheless described in the tradition of the church as one who was a martyr in intent, if not actually in deed. This person who went off and ended his life in exile, seeing visions and dreaming dreams of what it is that God intends for the perfection of creation, who ended up writing all that down in the form of the Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. Is this thing that to us seems very strange and, 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 and disturbing in a way, but was really meant to be comforting, was really meant in a long and complex way of saying, in the end, God wins. In the end, God triumphs and all is made right in the universe. So once again, a fisherman, a, a, a merchant who knows what he was, ended up with these, these mystical visions of what it is God dreams of for the universe and so is remembered as a mystic, one who somehow could see what it is that God sees, imagine how it is that God imagines. What a great gift to be given. And then the 28th, the Feast of the Holy Innocents. We know very little about the reality behind the story, but it makes sense, at least from a worldly perspective, that if those who were in power, the Hasmoneans, those who had been propped up by the Romans to rule Judah, felt that their power wasn't very secure and that somebody else had come along who others were describing as a king, they better go find out who this was and shut him down before he could take over. And so they went and 
killed anyone they could find who would be the right age, the right gender, born in the right time at the right place. Those small children had no chance to witness themselves. And yet they were, in many ways, witnesses. There's an episode of Barney Miller, the cop comedy show from the 70s, where there's been some incident that happens out in the city somewhere, and a bunch of people who have witnessed it come to the police station to make statements. And the comedy in the episode revolves around the fact that these people are not especially pure, nice, upright characters. They're just the people who happen to see what happened. They bring all of their problems, all of their, their, their confusions and, and side issues, whatever they were going to do before this happened, with them into the police station. And that's kind of where these children found themselves. They are who they were, and yet they are witnesses. There's a line in a song by U2 that says, their blood still cries from the ground. Simply by what happened to them, they are witnesses for what the world will do when it discovers the power of God trying to creep in just a little bit and undercut it. What the power of the world will do when it feels threatened in any way. And so all of those children are named as witnesses. Witnesses both to the power of God and to the way that the world, however inefficiently, will try to slap back at it. And then December 29th, the Feast of St. Thomas a Becket. Another good example of someone who's a kind of mixed character. He was a, a pretty successful politician, a, a layperson who worked in government, friend of the king, went on diplomatic missions, did other probably at times dirty work for the king as a, a civil servant. So the king thought, well, here's somebody I can put into a position of power and I'll have my buddy there and it'll work out well. Now, little did he know. He made him Archbishop of Canterbury. And unfortunately for the king, once the archbishop was in the job, he began to discover what the job entailed and began to do it. And he no longer, the king no longer had a buddy where he needed one. And so whether intentionally or unintentionally, deliberately or not, the king brought about Becket's death in the cathedral at an altar by tradition as he was worshiping and so he comes down to us as one who was converted one who was convicted somehow all of that experience began to bear in upon him he discovered that his faith was real that there was something in it that he had to act on again what a wonderful gift for you and for me to be reminded that our faith builds over time. It's, 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 it's gathering up in our hearts, in our lives, and sooner or later, it becomes the brick wall that we run into and discover, oh, it's really there. I really have to do something about this. Each one of us is sooner or later convicted by our faith. And then December 30th or 31st, depending upon which version of our calendar you look at, there is a woman named Godet, I'm blanking on her first, Francis Godet, born in a log cabin in Mississippi, poor, African-American, in a position of, of very little power. Through her faith, she came to be connected to the temperance movement in the 19th century, went to an international temperance convention at one point in her life, but is best known and best remembered as one who began to take a deep interest in the lives of those in prison. First African-American men specifically, and then on a broader scale, people who were in prison and people who had come out of prison, recognizing that there are many kinds of prisons that we find ourselves in. Not simply the literal one with bars and locks, but all the others that may follow. And so she became involved in education and housing and employment and all the other things that people need, particularly when they come out of prison and have nothing. She was, in a way, in a strong way, a liberator. One who recognized the many prisons that people find themselves in and began to find keys, began to unlock doors, and began to free those around her from what kept them in captivity. 
And that's only the few that have happened just in the last week and a half. All those people, all those new names that they received because of their faith, because of their response to the gift they had been given by God. What names have you been given this year? Do you know any of them? Sometimes we go through our lives so blindly and so quickly we fail even to notice them. Well, here we are on the last day of the year, dear friends. Here we are at, by Christian standards, the middle of the Christmas season, I should say. Now is the time to go back and look at those gifts. Not just the ones that came this week, but the ones that came all year. Maybe more importantly, we are on the threshold of another year. What names will we be given this year? How will we make ourselves able to notice them? What will we do differently, you and I individually and all of us together, to notice what it is that God is dropping into our lap? What we are being named, what we are being called to do. It's the season of being grateful. Let us be grateful for all that we have been given, all that we will be given. Let us pray to God that we will have the courage to take up those names, take up those ministries, and live them in our lives. Amen.